My next guest is an MMA media personality and play-by-play -play announcer, and on September 23rd, he'll be lacing up the boxing gloves and stepping foot in the squared circle in England when he takes on Gabriel Silva on September 23rd. He joins me right now. He is Ben the Bane Davis. You look What's good, going? Ben. Uh, I I'm hope, looking uh, clean, baby. I'm dropping weight. I'm feeling fast. That's all you can ask, you know what I mean? You look absolutely fantastic. I could tell you've been training for this. You look like you're in shape, and you look like you're ready to uh, punch somebody's lights out here at the end of the well, month. Well, the good news is I'm only giving you the traps up. The traps are looking good. <laughs> <laughs> hey. I'm still a little fluffy, man, but, you know, yeah, it's I'm feeling good, man. It's been a fun training camp. Ben, you are one of the most gifted uh, commentators that I know about in the MMA scene. I love watching your work, and what's unique about you in particular is – you're not just with one particular promotion. Like I've seen you with multiple promotions all over the country. And I kind of wanted to like hone in on one specific question. That's difficult to do, not only for the pure fact of bouncing around promotions, but there are different people in the booth with you. And mm -hmm. like the best shows, like you have people that are working together for a really long amount of time. And that's not always the case with you, but nonetheless, I feel like you do a really good job creating chemistry with the people you're sharing the booth with. How do you do that? Man, first off, thank you for the kind words, brother. I mean, that really means a lot. I take a lot of pride in the commentating. And uh, excellent question. You know, it is a tall task bouncing between five different gigs. And even in the ones that I do for a long period of time, sometimes we'll switch up the booth or maybe a color commentator is, is unavailable. So I think for me, the best thing is trust. You know, I really need to get the color commentators or analysts, whoever I'm working with, to trust me. And because they know I'll be teeing you up. I'll be throwing to you like I you will have plenty of time, like just be in my hands and be happy and trust me there. Um, and, and you know, typically I'm there a couple of days before. And so I'll get the chance to meet him and we'll go out and get drinks or lunches. And, um, you know, you build a rapport. And I completely agree. I think the best booths have that chemistry that's been cultivated over years but um sometimes things just click and i've thankfully had a really good ability at just making shit click quick uh in, in a spot where i kind of needed to i mean if i was doing a horrible job conducting the booths and like you could tell the energy was off man my success would have stopped a long time ago <laughs> completely understand um another person in this space that i'm really impressed with is david evans and you two have worked together quite a bit over the years and i was hoping you can talk to me a little bit about him he's like one of the like most analytical minds that i know of that covers the regional mma scene um he's talked about as a fighter firstly but he is excellent at what he does what makes him so good at his craft in your opinion i think it's how he articulates things you know he can really boil things down and make the complex uh very generalized and easy to understand for individuals that either don't train or haven't had as much experience and 100 percent, i think as a fighter he is so talented and gifted um but he, he's he's got a he's got a big heart on that's what i love the most about david man he is a family man through and through always with his nephew and um, you know, giving back it the best way he can. But in terms of what makes him different, I think for sure, it just boils down to that articulation because a lot of people, especially when they're on a mic, they're on a camera, they kind of forget how to talk or they'll have verbal crutches and um, things right, right there. Uh, you know what I mean? And, and David does not have that problem. Thankfully, he is just seamless. So I love working with him. Flex uh, Fight Series, APFC, A1 Combat. You're traveling all over the country, and these are just some of the promotions that you've called. I know there are plenty others I'm leaving out. I, I, I'm, keying, I'm keying this question up in particular for a reason. Regional MMA, I feel, is a lot more volatile compared to Bellator, compared to mm -hmm. UFC. Lineup changes a plenty. Some guys don't even show up for the weigh-ins, particularly for the amateurs. That happens. <laughs> That's actually pretty commonplace. And yeah. that wreaks havoc. For somebody like you who needs to know a little bit about everybody leading up to these fights, can you kind of like peel back that onion for me a little bit and just kind of tell me how the hell do you prepare for like multiple shows all over the country? There's got you got to be like a mad scientist. There's got to be all kinds of shit going on behind the background that we don't see. There's yeah, I would say like 90 percent of the work isn't what anyone is privy to. Uh, it's topology scrubs. That's about I would say half um just going through guys records getting okay they've got five first round finishes or they've got three rear naked chokes or just finding again my whole job is finding storylines so if some dude is known for quick knockouts then that's going to be how we dub him in the booth if some guy is a submission specialist and he's got 11 
uh, you know, arm bars, then guess what? That's how we're going to W in the booth. So doing those topology scrubs and that to your question is where it gets hard in the amateur scene when there aren't topology pages, when there isn't existing information. And like you said, it, it does change. I've, I've had many shows where the night of the fights, the card is changing and bouts are like getting reworked because someone, you know, at the venue fell over or collapsed. And, well, we need someone to fight Austin. So why don't we pluck this guy from that matchup and bring him over? So that does provide challenges. And um, ultimately, I think I, I've just had to accept at times, you know, I won't have the most information and I won't feel like this is the, the best prep that I can do where I've got all the uh, questions and answers that I want. And you just got to roll with it. You know, I've had a couple shows where I do to travel. I've been fucked with travel the last year. Um, I'll roll in like 2 a.m. on fight day Ugh. and my notes are like half done. So I wake up. I'm tired. I'm just scrambling to get done and then go do a show. You know, it's kind of how APFC was this last time around because I did a one in LA and then overnight had to go to Indiana. Um, my notes weren't as good as they typically were. And I was like, fuck, I feel a little bad. When I look back, when I first started the first 100 plus episodes, I'd say like the first 150 episodes of my podcast were complete dog shit. Uh, a <laughs> lot of it was me not knowing how to queue up questions correctly um or uh gee yeah. i would get really nervous really startled um and it's not because i'm nervous about my guests it's just now i have lights on me and there's no live exactly. people in my office but at the same time i can't describe that it's just you have to just kind of like get used to that presence so for me i look back at like those early episodes and i was like wow i say a lot of filler words i use crutch words i shouldn't i should have prepared maybe a little bit differently and from there, I start to like unpack and like figure out like, okay, Tyler, these are the areas you need to improve upon. And I try to do that regularly. I'm curious, yeah. how do you benchmark yourself and how do you evolve and improve as a professional commentator? That's a good question. Um, you know, I think that for me, it's about constantly a about the fighters, you know, am I making this person's fight the best? best and biggest that can be am i providing that for them um you know and there's there's some fights where i feel like i knocked it out of the park and some fights where i'm like well like i could have again we talked about dubbing guys this way or that way i could have drawn them up and, and created this storyline and weaved a narrative a bit better here or you know you get to the work within the booth i could have thrown it a little bit to this person instead of that person i could have in those sequences asked this question that could have led to a better answer and breakdown than a generalized one so i think it's it's the little things um one of the big things i'm working on right now is the intros like the pay-per-view stand-up opens and all that like because i script those memorize them and and uh try and pump them out the best way i can and that's the biggest one that i'm, I'm focused on i feel good in a lot of other places um and there is always constant work to do but my main focus is like nail the open that's the first thing people see I fuck up the open that's probably not great so my focus for the last like month and a half two months has just been crush that opening and you know seamlessly transition whether you're like a big mma personality like you or just a humble podcasting host like me there's like a certain sense of like bravery that goes with that and that sounds pretty fucking crazy if you aren't in any of this and you're just watching this you <laughs> video as a regular person or as a regular fan but i'm gonna i'm gonna try to explain why i say that because when you're putting yourself out there when you're creating content whether you're behind a camera commentating on a fight or you're just putting out youtube videos like me like you're putting yourself out there for people to react oh, yeah. to. and for somebody who's not like a real public figure when i did that the very first time like i really wasn't like mentally prepared for what I would get good, bad, or ugly. I just, I really wasn't, I didn't really think about any of that stuff. And I've kind of figured out over the years that like one out of like maybe 10 comments that I get, whether it be like a DM, uh, an email, or some other form of hate message, um, nine, nine, uh, 90% of them are just exactly that hate filled messages, just people really trying to attack me for whatever, reason. Yeah. Yeah. for whatever reason um maybe i you know i didn't say something nice about uh somebody they like or you know a fighter that they're supporting or or maybe they just are having a shitty day and they're like you know what fuck tyler little I, let's let's you know make fun of him <laughs> right and yeah. 
that kind of like took me aback when I first started. And I was, so I was kind of like wondering from, from your sense, like you've got, you get trolled all the time. And for people that are like getting into this space, do you have like a message for them? Like for your fellow content creators, for other people that are in this MMA community that might be putting themselves out there for the very first time. And as far as like handling trolls and just shit talkers and the terrible people, like how do they kind of push that off to the side and kind of focus in on the task at hand? Well, I think you teed it up beautifully in the sense where putting yourself out there, creating content is challenging and it's uh, uncharted territory. And it is um, sometimes scary to break out of the mold a little bit. You know what I mean? Um, whether that be the reaction from friends and family, or again, those people online that for whatever reason will toss you shit. And my biggest, I guess, piece of advice or what I try and do. And, um, you know, again, like it, it, I see all of it, you know what I mean? It's in my notification box. Like some people go, Oh, we just don't look at the comments. Like that is hard <laughs> sometimes not to do. And it is frustrating, but I've always just kind of told myself and, uh, embrace the fact that these people that are shit talking or give like saying homophobic slurs and all that shit, like, they're not doing anything. They're not doing anything with their lives. I just have to look in the mirror and, in like the least arrogant way possible because I've really tried to be a very grounded guy over the last couple of years. But, you know, I'll, I'll listen, commentating on Fight Pass within a, less than a year of in-person MMA commentary. I'm fighting Gabe Silva. What are you doing? Like, you can sit there and go, oh, you're gay, you should die. But like, fucking go go check your own shit before you try and attack me like and i think that's that's the biggest piece of advice is um to people that'll put something out and 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 get that hateful reaction like their words mean nothing they mean so fucking little like i only you, you got to have an ear for constructive criticism and people that you look to for that level of feedback but the random person and I've, I've adopted this for both ways about it truthfully like the love and the hate it, it, it's noise man you know it really is just noise and the support that i get online is it, it really is amazing and it's motivated me a lot and uh it's touched me in a lot of ways that that i i didn't even think would be possible sitting in my dorm room junior year at asu going yeah i can't do finance because this is making me really unhappy so let me start shit talking on twitter you know what i mean like it's stuff you don't realize but um you got to push through it so for guys that put stuff out there and they're getting hate if you stop that is the biggest failure that's the that's the win for all those guys because then they broke you you know so don't stop fuck them they're nothing <laughs> i couldn't agree more and if there's one thing i could add to your response it would be and this is a line that I've used to respond to my own trolls. When I feel like it, 90% of the time, I probably yeah. don't even respond to them. But now I say, that's great that you think that uh, I'm a cancer patient and I'm gay and or whatever else they tell yeah, me. Yeah. Um, but I say, you know what's great about 2023? Nobody's stopping you from doing your own shit. So show me how it's done then. Then you go out. Yeah. There, then you do it better. Me. Yeah, then you do it then. And then, you know, they're not going to tell you anything. So I would just throw that out there, too. Most That's of a good one. Um, and Ben, um, what's interesting about you is I want to pivot now. I want to talk less about commentary and more about you as an actual competitor. Now we're taking off the headset for the second mm -hmm. time. We're actually going out in there. The man in the arena, baby. I love it. Fury grappling. We did that. And now we're going into the boxing <laughs> scene. And before we like kind of like dive into the boxing one for a second. Like at what point do people tell you like, that's cool, dude, you, you're you a great commentator. You're, you're pretty mm -hmm. good at it. But like, what the fuck are you thinking? Taking off your headset and like going in there against like rolling with a black belt. Like, what are you thinking? You're going up against Anderson Silva's kid. Like, bro, like what the fuck are yeah. you doing? Like, what is this all about? Like, what is your response to all that? Because I'm sure you've got that question probably from your uh, close inner circle. Oh, dude, my family hates that I'm doing this. My family is so mad at me uh, for doing this. My dad was like, he's like, well, just make sure you don't get hospitalized. And I was like, dude, that's not that's not confidence building. You know what I mean? So, yeah, you know, I've got a lot of people close in my life that that question the decision. And it is a wild one. I mean, it takes um some some screws loose to 
sign these dotted lines over and over again, and especially with how good the grappling match went. I mean, <laughs> that, you know, bouncing back. For, well, that's my thing. I'm like, it can't go worse. It almost could not go worse than a 13-second angle lock where my heel or my, my top of my foot breaks. I'm in a boot for six weeks. I'm like, it probably can't go worse than that. But, no, I mean, it, it's – um. I don't know. A lot of people like to talk, man. A lot of people like to chat and I, I like to walk it as well. Um, so when I have the opportunities to go out there and lay it on the line a bit, I'm more than happy to do so. And again, I recognize that I'm not the most talented guy far from it. Oh my God. I am the worst. We were doing sprints with Billy Q's guys and I was the last dude <laughs> running up and down. Um, but I'm, I'm about that, man. And I'm not afraid to, again, just show it. And yeah, like I, I wish I had more time to train and like actually be in the gym and commit. But with the broadcasting schedule, dude, since February, I've been on the road three weeks a month, basically every month. I think I was on the road seven weeks at one point, just bouncing here, there, here, there. So, you know, for people that do shit on my ability, I'm like, I've got a pretty damn good reason why I'm not the best <laughs> boxer athlete in the world. But no, yeah, a lot of people hate that I'm doing this and um <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're still going to do it. You, I don't hate that you're doing it. Um, when I f heard about the Fury Grappling, of course, I laughed about it. And then, um, but then I thought to myself after the, I saw the Tapology page, and then after I read uh, the thing that Alex B. Hunan put out, after I got my good laughs out of that, I looked at it and I was just like, okay, but all that aside, all that aside, put all that shit aside, he's still going to go out there. He's going to fucking do it. It doesn't matter what the result is. The point is, he's going to make the walk. He's going to put himself out there in a exactly. totally different area that most people don't have the fucking courage to do. Like, most people would never do that. Like, well, especially, especially people in the industry, you know, that are media members or broadcasters. Like, um, you, you, you just don't see a lot of play-by-plays outside of, you know, Sean O'Connell, <laughs> who's had that background. You know what I mean? But um, I don't know. I think, and again, there's a lot of people over the years that have sent me a lot of messages and been like, yo, you're inspirational and, and you really motivate me to do this. And especially in this fight camp earlier today, I had a, a commentator who was like, man, like I'm going to go in there and do some MMA later this year because of, of what you're doing. And I think that's also a big reason, you know, I've been in many points in my life where I need some external push and I need to see something and go, man, that's fucking sick. That's enabling me to, try and do what I want to do and, and, and push harder and be better. So if, if that, if I can be that for people, great, man, you know, that's, uh, I think that's, that's, you got to do more good than bad when it's all said and done, you know, you got to leave the world a little better than, than when you found it. So who knows for fighting, it's way more than just like getting, picking up a win. It's, it, it's way more than the actual event itself. And there's usually a story behind why fighters are going out there, why they're putting their body on the line, why they're putting their brain on the line for entertainment. Yeah. There's usually a compelling answer. So my question to you is like, what is it that you're fighting for? Like, what is it that you're, uh, what's compelling you to put in the work? What's compelling you to do the cardio? What's compelling you to do the diet? Cause you don't have to do any of this shit, Ben, you get to do it. No. Yeah, it is. Uh, thankfully, a choice and very voluntary. Um, I think that when my life is done, I just really want to be able to look back at every chapter and and enjoy reading the story. Genuinely, like, I mean, I'm a younger dude, so hopefully that's not for a while. Um, but again, if I get in a, a car crash tomorrow, I can look back and go, you know what? I made the most of what I had and the time that I had. I, I did what I could and I was trying every day to do something different and um, just leave behind a, a, a good book to, for people to read. So I don't know, I think that is part of it. And um, again, like it's a little respect oriented as well. If y'all want to get some respect, I, I think people, again, the trashing and whatnot, I'm like, well, that's, that's all well and good, but you better fucking respect me, period. Like I, I'm fine with the trolling and all the teasing and whatnot, but the second they start chatting about real disrespectful shit, I'm like, you better pump the brakes, buddy. Um, but I don't know. I think in a, in a long, I'm giving you a lot of long winded answers. I did some sparring earlier, so my fucking head's hurting <laughs> um, and it might not be the most coherent shit. Uh, but yeah, why do I do it? A, because not a lot of other people do and B, 
Because when I knock out Gabe Silva, everyone's going to be like, yo, that's fucking sick as hell. <laughs> hey, well, let's talk about Gabe Silva. You'll be fighting him at the tail end of the month now. I've read a few other stories. I've watched a few of your other interviews. And you've kind of said the same consistent message. Number one, and, and if I had to paraphrase some of what you've mm-hmm. Sure. That in previous interviews, it would be number one, nobody's really giving me a chance. Nobody is. And yeah. um, I'm expecting him to come in and try to like hunt for my head, but he's going to be surprised at how tough I am. Uh, that That's kind of more or less like the gist of what it is that you see. But I kind of have a, a, a different question for you. And it's like, typically if a guy's going to go out there and take your head off, like that would involve, if you come through that unscathed, that would involve him being like seriously fatigued potentially. And if he's fatigued, that could open it up for a finish on your end, couldn't it? Dude, rounds two through four. Rounds two through four. That's what people got to watch. Round one, it's going to be tough. That That's what he's going to be doing. And I've got a lot of faith in my durability and, and my own cardio uh, and, and belief that I can, you know, after watching his tape, knowing what weapons he's going to be using, I believe I can make it through that first round. And he thinks I'm not going to. So rounds two through four, that's where it's going to get interesting. Um but, yeah, I don't know. I think that uh, those two things certainly I've maintained. No one's given me a chance. And uh, he he's going to come here for a knockout. And the promotion wants a knockout as well. I mean, that that is the funny part of this is I love Mams Taylor and Misfits. And it is a great opportunity. And I, I really have liked a lot of the people I've communicated with during this process. But they want Gabe to come in and kill me because then you get Gabe Silva. Khalil will probably come in and you get the sons of Anderson fighting on misfits. Like I, dude, I would do the same thing, man. Like it's a, it's a classic move. Um, It makes so much sense. Um, It's just, it's going to be really funny when that doesn't happen. It's going to be so funny when that plan just gets turned upside down a bit. For um, the fight that happens on September 23rd, When you think outside of like the physical elements, like when we start, mm-hmm. like, let's not talk about cardio. Let's not talk about knockouts or decisions. Just simply the fact that a, not a lot of people are going to give you a chance and B like a lot of people like expect him to go out there and perform. Like you really have no expectations to go out there other than you just need to go out there, not get killed and just simply do your best. If As long as you yeah. do that, expectations are met right he needs to win he needs to put you away is that an advantage in your favor because all that pressure and all the expectations are on your opponent oh yeah dude 100 percent. the pressure's all on him man um like i i this is kind of what i did with the grappling match as well um and what i've been able to consistently do is i find these win-win situations where there is quite literally no way that i walk out of this with a loss and even if i get sparked with the first punch that's still a win for me, baby. <laughs> At the end of the day, the Bane always wins. Um, and so for sure, I think it's a, a good factor. And um, it almost mentally makes me want to you know, obviously beat his ass more, right? Because there's so many expectations. And, and, and the assumption is, the existing assumption is, that he's going to come out there and look fantastic. And so I'm like, well, it's, just, it's just motivation. But I don't know. I've got no pressure on me. Like people, I think the bright lights will get, not get to me a little bit because, again, I've been an I was an actor for a number of years. I've been commentating for a while. I did the grappling match, which is going to be a very similar parallel to walking out, competing, getting in that mindset. I've, I've been I've been done it before, um, but I don't know. I might lost my train of thought on that one. <laughs> Perfectly okay. That's okay. We can still save the day. September twenty third. Everyone who's either going to show up in England to watch you fight in person or stream it. Uh, purchase the pay-per-view what can they expect to see when you go out to perform against Gabe I think they're just going to be surprised I think they're going to be very surprised my coach and I Seth Wheeler we've cooked up a really good game plan and if I have the ability to execute it which I have a lot of faith in myself uh, to do so people are going to be very surprised um and I'm not, I mean, you know, I'm a realist, grounded. The odds are against me on this one. It's a stacked hand. Uh, and I'm playing, you know, fucking Uno cards and he's got a full house, right? That's kind of what we're looking at. Uh, but I think that if there was going to be a big upset in 2023 and there are, there's already been a couple, there's going to be another one. Well, ladies and gentlemen, make sure on September 23rd that you tune in to watch 
my guest Ben Davis do what it was he was put on this earth to do. Talk about fights and swing fists. Here we go, baby. Let's go. September 23rd. <laughs> uh, ben, I appreciate your time this afternoon. And I wanted to give you an opportunity. If there's anyone out there that you would like to thank or if there's any uh, sponsors or whatever that you need to talk about, let's do yeah. it. Yeah, dude. First off, big thank you to my coach, Seth. You know, he's, he's taken – weeks uh of his time put into me with the pad sessions and coming to florida with me and um you know cornering me in newcastle like the i i got so much love for that um so him 100 percent seth wheeler big ups and then natty combat sports apparel <laughs> go buy yourself some natty gear all natural athletes that's the move no no peds no epos that's for pussies go get some natty Ben, i appreciate your time i look forward to having you back uh, ahead of your next fight against, uh, well, an unnamed celebrity, we'll just say. <laughs> Appreciate it, man.